You know, Paul, I wanted to tell you about my struggle, my steroid addiction. Okay. Paul, it's only made me stronger. <laughs> We're on the same web page. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Are you ready? This is, I, I've announced um, off air that this will be the single best joke I ever tell on the show. Matt. Let's go. <laughs> Elena, what kind of drug should dinosaurs never take? I, I don't know, Paul. Asteroid. <laughs> I was going to try really hard not to laugh. <laughs> that is gold. The Curbsiders Podcast is for entertainment, education, and information purposes only, and the topics discussed should not be used solely to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any diseases or conditions. For the more the views and statements expressed on this podcast are solely those of those, and should not be interpreted to reflect official policy or position of any entity, aside from possibly cash like more hospital and affiliate outreach programs, if indeed there are any. In fact, there are none. Pretty much, we are responsible if you screw up. You should always do your own homework and let us know when we're wrong. Welcome back to The Curbsiders. I'm Dr. Matthew Frank Watto, here with America's primary care physician, Dr. Paul Nelson-Williams. Paul, how are you doing? I'm still recovering from that fantastic pun you just told. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, and I'm apparently, um, the listeners will hear, I'm also America's killjoy tonight. Apparently, I don't have a whole lot of fun doing primary care, but I, I am good. <laughs> Thank you for asking. How are you? I just said you're, you should be more adventurous when you're ordering testing in, in primary care. That's <laughs> Absolutely it. Absolutely not. <laughs> so on tonight's show, we're going to be talking about adrenal insufficiency with a great guest, Dr. Atil Kargi, uh, who is a great physician, uh, and we'll tell you more about him in a second, But and we'll also introduce our fantastic guest host. But before we get to that, Paul, tell, tell the audience, what is it that we do on the Curbsiders? Thanks, Matt. As always, we are the Internal Medicine Podcast. We use expert interviews to bring you clinical pearls and practice changing knowledge. As you mentioned, we are fortunate to be joined by super producer, writer of the episode, Dr. Elena Gibson, curbsider's fave. Elena, how are you? Uh, I'm lovely. How are you? <laughs> I'm still well. Thank you so much for asking. You know, um, Paul, she's in the middle of a GI fellowship. I mean, like, how much enthusiasm is she going to muster at 10 o'clock at night? I get you know? lost in the colon every day. It's fun. <laughs> <laughs> um, why, why it's, <laughs> that, that all sounds delightful, um, and I am without envy, but why don't we have you uh, tell us about who we talked to and a little bit about what we talked about tonight, Elena? Yeah, I'd love to. So we have a great conversation with our guest, Dr. Atil Kargi. He is a clinical endocrinologist and co-director of the Pituitary Center at UNC Chapel Hill, where he joined the faculty in 2023. He was previously on faculty at the University of Miami, where he was primarily involved in medical education as director of the Endocrinology Fellowship and course director for the Endocrine and Reproductive Systems course of the Miller School of Medicine. And his educational stardom definitely shines in this episode as he walks us through adrenal insufficiency, including a review of the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis, how to recognize and treat both primary and secondary adrenal insufficiency. So let's get to it. And I did want to just quickly thank the American Association of Clinical Endocrinologists who uh, hooked us up with Dr. Cargi. We, we've worked with them a bunch in the past and, and hopefully we'll be uh, having some more fantastic guests from them uh, as we go forward because I, I got to tell you, Dr. Cargi does a great job on what is a, a topic that has been vexing to me, but I, I think really... Uh, this made it a lot more clear. I did want to remind the audience that this and most episodes are available for free CME credit for all health professionals through VCU Health at curbsiders.vcuhealth.org. And then one last quick plug is, uh, Paul, we have a Patreon now. Oh, fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> did, you, uh, did you want to say anything about it? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> thanks for, thanks for that setup Matt. yeah no we have a patreon now it is it's been a, a pleasure spending even more time recording episodes with matt so we do some additional bonus episodes that are sort of these really tightly refined uh delightful recaps of prior episodes just all killer no filler we also have um the discord where we actually get to interact with people who listen to the show there's been a lot of great conversations not just about medical topics but about books we've liked so if you've been missing picks of the week um that this might be where you'd find them. We actually talk a lot more about sort of stuff that we've been enjoying lately too. There are candid pictures of Matt, I think, yo-yoing. So if that's something you're into, um, <laughs> it's it really, it almost pays for itself if you look at it from that standpoint. So, um, so consider uh, supporting yeah. the show. And for those who already do, thank you so much. Yeah, patreon.com slash curbsiders. Atil, 
we've been talking for a while. I, I want to get the audience in on this and they're going to want to know a hobby or interest that you have outside of medicine. So please, please share one. Yeah, I like to play tennis and I just picked up on watching international volleyball. Yeah, that's right. We were trying to see if this volleyball app is going to start going wild during the recording. <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, but I I didn't know. Now, where are you where are you watching this volleyball? Because I know you can stream like soccer on any like five, six different apps these days. Is volleyball all just one app that you're yeah, using or one there's, site? There's, there's two that I've been using. One's called uh, VBTV or Volleyball TV. And then the other one that I just, you know, subscribed to for one month uh, was called Eurovolley. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm Turkish and the Turkish women's volleyball team just, uh, won the European championships for the first time ever. Apparently it's the first time any Turkish team has ever won any big championship in any sport. <laughs> <Nice>. <laughs> Congratulations. So every, everyone's celebrating the women's volleyball. Oh, that's fantastic. A good time to become a fan. It is. Uh, yeah. I picked up right on time. <laughs> uh, another question that we like to ask is what's something like meaningful advice or feedback that you've received during your career or training? Yeah. One, one time a colleague of mine who I kind of view as a mentor told me how important it is to be, you know, very positive with every patient encounter. And I remember he was telling me about a, a family member of his who went to see a physician, you know, for an unrelated condition. And they had a condition that really there wasn't much treatment for, but the physician was so positive that, you know, they left the room feeling better about things. And I think, you know, up until that point, I hadn't thought about that too much. And I've tried to practice that way that, you know, when people come in to see us, our patients, they're oftentimes very stressed. And if we can make sure that they're leaving, you know, in a positive note and feeling better about things than when they came in, that that's, that's, you know, we all kind of at certain, a certain point know what to do most of the time for most cases, but you know, how we make our patients feel and, and leaving on a positive note is an important thing. Yeah. No, I love that. I, my learners are probably sick of hearing me say, I often think the visit is more therapeutic than the intervention much of the time, uh, at least if you do it right. Absolutely. So a question we also love to hear uh, from our, our experts is if you could just tell us about one of your favorite failures, um, doesn't have to be even medical necessarily. Yeah, I guess related to tennis, a, a failure. So, you know, growing up, I lived in a town in Illinois and they had this uh, city championship when I was in middle school. And I remember when I was in the, when I was 13, I played in the 14 and unders and I was, you know, expecting to do well. And I lost in an early round, but th they had this consolation tournament for all the losers of the early rounds. And then I went on to win the consolation tournament. And the next year I played again in the 14 and unders and I made it all the way to the semifinals. But I also was in the 18 and unders. And again, I lost in the, the, the early rounds, but then I made it all the way to the consolation final. And, you know, I won it again that year. So, you know, the, I think my failure turned into at least, the, you know, a secondary success. They even gave me a Trophy. I think my parents have that in their home. Um, and so I made lemonade out of lemons, so to speak. <laughs> Do you still, are you still playing tennis? I, I think adults stop playing sports too often. And I, I feel like we should continue to play sports if, if we're right. able to as, as adults. So yeah. hopefully well, that's a great thing playing. about tennis is, you know, it can be played at every age and, you know, for families, people of all levels. Uh, so yeah, I've, you know, I recently um, changed academic institutions that I worked at and in my new place, I found a really wonderful tennis club in a nice community um, to play tennis with. Oh, that's fantastic. Are you are you a tennis player that hates pickleball or are you like what are, what are your thoughts on pickleball? I do I do like pickleball. I'm kind of new <laughs> into yeah, I'm new into the pickleball <laughs> scene, but uh, I noticed that the you know the tennis club has pickleball too. So some right. days, you know, I went and did, did a little pickleball, but now I'm back to doing mainly tennis. <laughs> a lot of my patients have been telling me they play pickleball and then I have some patients that play tennis and when like I asked one of the tennis players the other day like do you play pickleball too? And and he gave me a look like I should I should leave the room and I'm yeah, no yeah. longer like he basically fired me on child? the spot. Yeah, yeah. There definitely is friction, you know, especially since I guess the pickleball people are taking up space in the tennis club now. Yep. Some of the tennis players are you know don't want to share the resources or the space with too much pickleball. Yeah. The pickleball and people I, are painting lines on the tennis courts. Yeah, it's a big, it's a whole problem. Right, right. <laughs> I don't know enough about either to know the answer to this, but can like a, a decent tennis player just go and destroy a mediocre pickleball player? Like is if you're good at tennis, does that guarantee do, success at pickleball? Yeah, I, I, I think maybe the answer is yes. I don't know about destroy, but you can pick up no, on pickleball, sure. yeah, pretty easily um, once you learn. There, you know, there's some quirks about like the rules and the strategy that are different, that, but when, you could pick up on that within a couple days. But if you're a good tennis player, I think you could 
beat a mediocre t- pickleball player. I just I like the idea of a sad pickleball player. Is really <laughs> the of this question. Probably. I don't think it works the other way around, though. I don't think a good pickleball player necessarily could beat a tennis player at tennis. Now, now we're not. talking. Yeah. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. I've played some pickleball, and it's like the benefit is it's very easy to pick up. You can do it like any day, but yeah. I don't. I cannot play tennis at all. So. Well, Paul, we've successfully derailed the show once again, and uh, now we, we're now apparently putting on a tennis and pickleball podcast. <laughs> I think recently it's been baking, but now, you know, we, we, we're just showing our range, Paul. That's all. That's my point here. Work-life uh, balance, Wano. Uh, <laughs> Elena, can you read us a case from Cashlack so we could uh, start to talk about adrenal insufficiency? Hey, on this episode, you might notice that we don't really talk about how to manage adrenal crisis. That's because it was already covered by our hospital medicine team on episode number 372. Meredith and Moni talked with Dr. Sarah Blakely all about how to recognize and manage adrenal crisis. So check out number 372. This episode focuses more on outpatient care and prevention of adrenal crisis. So the first case, we have a 53-year-old with a history of hypothyroidism and celiac disease, comes to clinic with a three-month history of weakness, fatigue, decreased appetite, and nausea. Also describes a 10-pound unintentional weight loss in the last two months associated with this nausea and abdominal discomfort. So thinking about the differential for this case and the topic for our discussion today, when should adrenal insufficiency be included in our differential and what about the current case makes you think of it? Yeah, I think this is a a really good case to illustrate um, some of the salient points. Um, So I think anyone who's, you know, having unexplained anorexia and weight loss, and especially a lot of GI symptoms, uh, nausea, vomiting, abdominal pain, diarrhea, so, you know, we've seen a lot of these cases over the years um, come from GI clinics, and I don't know that people think to check for this in those cases. Um, so they've had all, you know, all sorts of endoscopies, and we love to do procedures, and until someone's thought to do a simple task of just checking a morning cortisol. Um, you know, another scenario I think that would be, you know, really important, or a group of scenarios, is in individuals who have risk factors you know, for having adrenal insufficiency, such as antecedent steroid exposure or having had prior history of brain or rain, uh, pituitary directed radiation or surgeries. In this case, I think, you know, that aspect of it is that she has already two autoimmune conditions and especially in endocrine, um, there's polyglandular autoimmune syndrome. So, you know, an individual who has one autoimmune condition is much more likely to get another one. And so, you know, she has hypothyroidism. Uh, this patient, we, they don't give us the details, but unless she had a thyroidectomy, almost certainly the cause is Hashimoto's disease, which is autoimmune and celiac disease obviously is autoimmune. So it really should be high on the differential. I think the challenge here is, you know, as an endocrinologist is almost all of the other conditions we see commonly in endocrinology, we pick up on all the time, even if we don't want to, because the lab test used to identify them is part of routine panels. So everyone's, you know, checking glucose and calcium and uh, TSH all the time, but we rarely think to check cortisol levels. Um, And another challenge here is that cortisol levels fluctuate a lot. So it probably is good that we don't check too many cortisol levels because cortisol being a stress hormone and having a circadian rhythm and having this pulsatile secretion can go up and down um, and be affected by many factors. Uh, So we don't, I don't, I'm not advocating for cortisol to be checked routinely, uh, but we do need to be thoughtful about when, when individuals are presenting with um, certain symptoms to check for it. Yeah, you could you could see how this would be missed because any of those symptoms, you know, you're working in primary care, half the patients I see tell me they have fatigue and, you know, a lot of other patients have just this vague nausea and it's, you know, you don't necessarily, it's not as in your face as the case that, that we're presenting here. So I I do feel it's a little bit tough. Can you tell us, um, before we get a little bit further into the diagnosis, can you tell us just the broad classifications? Remind us there's, you know, primary, secondary, tertiary, uh, what exactly those mean, just so we have our terms straight when we're going through things. Yeah, it might be helpful to just very briefly review the physiology so you you know we all understand. Remember, you know, adrenal the adrenal glands, and we're talking about the you know the adrenal cortex. The adrenal has a medulla and a cortex, and the primary hormone product of the cortex is cortisol. So we'll be talking a lot about measuring and treating with cortisol today. Um, and it's named after the adrenal cortex. If anyone wonders, why do we call that hormone cortisol? <laughs> because it comes from the cortex. Cortisol 
production would be zero. Believe me, I see this all the time. Zero if the pituitary gland didn't stimulate the adrenal gland with ACTH. And in turn, the uh, pituitary gland wouldn't make ACTH unless the hypothalamus stimulated the pituitary with CRH. So we call this hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis, the HPA axis. So it's important to just review that and that there is a negative feedback loop, whereas you know the circulating cortisol made in the adrenal does all this wonderful stuff, but it also goes by the brain and the hypothalamus and pituitary and exerts negative feedback, you know, informing it of its own levels and keeping its levels in check, etc. So this classification is basically um, uniform in all of endocrinology. Primary and secondary could be used for the thyroid or for the gonads. Primary adrenal sufficiency means that the disease or the failure is originating at the level of the adrenal gland. Whereas secondary adrenal insufficiency means that the adrenal gland itself isn't diseased per se. It could work. It's just that the pituitary and hypothalamus as a unit aren't able to stimulate it by making sufficient amounts of ACTH. For practical purposes, we usually only use the terms primary and secondary adrenal sufficiency. In textbooks, you'll read about that term tertiary adrenal sufficiency. It usually denotes that the hypothalamus isn't making enough CRH. In practical pur- for practical purposes, we usually can't distinguish whether the hypothalamus or the pituitary is at fault, and they work together as a unit anyway, because the way we make this distinction is by measuring cortisol and ACTH. So you could imagine that in an individual with primary adrenal insufficiency, cortisol will be low, and again, owing to that negative feedback loop, since the pituitary is healthy, it'll mount a robust ACTH response to try to stimulate the failing adrenal. Mm-hmm. ACTH levels will be high with a low cortisol, and that's primary adrenal insufficiency as I stated. And in secondary or tertiary adrenal sufficiency, because we don't commonly have the ability to measure CRH, we, but we measure ACTH in the circulation, you'll see that the cortisol will be low and the ACTH will also be low. But here's a big kicker, I think, and this is you know one of the many things that keeps endocrinologists in, in business is uh, in secondary adrenal sufficiency, uh, meaning you know the pituitary's failure of making enough ACTH, many times you'll see the cortisol will be low and the ACTH will be inappropriately normal. So that's why we can't diagnose this condition by just checking, uh, you know, um, ACTH alone. So the way we think about that is, you know, if you if you have low cortisol in your blood and you had a healthy pituitary, you should have really high levels of ACTH. And so the inability to mount that ACTH response to a low serum cortisol proves that the pituitary and hypothalamus, you know, are failing. Um, so if you see a very low cortisol with an inappropriately, you know, normal range ACTH. The problem is secondary adrenal insufficiency. And Atil, I feel like primary care doctors are pretty good about thinking about at least the tertiary uh, adrenal insufficiency. You know, that's why I remember as a resident just seeing these tortuous steroid tapers for patients right. who just had COPD. <laughs> so like they would just be given like this, you know, three and a half one taper when they started 40 milligrams or something insane like that. But in terms of primary um, adrenal insufficiency, what what kind of things would we as adult doctors think about that might actually be causes of that? What are What are some... What are, yeah, what are some causes of primary? Yeah, and this is a, you know, a wonderful question, and it you know, ties into what Matt was asking earlier about the, you know, that these symptoms are so vague and protean. So what, you know, what do we really need to look for or think about to narrow down the patients who could have this? You know, I'll point out, you know, as you said, um, secondary or tertiary adrenal sufficiency is very common. So primary adrenal sufficiency is actually a very rare disease. I mean, I think the incidence is just one or two cases per million per year. Um, where the adrenal itself is failing. To directly answer the question, you know, you asked about the causes, you know, in the in in the developed world, it's almost always autoimmune. You know, that's why this case really gives you a good clue. You know, it, for instance, at least 50% of patients with Addison's disease, primary adrenal insufficiency, have another autoimmune disease. So that could be helpful. And the most common one by far is hypothyroidism. So that could help quite a bit. Now, the vast majority of people with hypothyroidism will never get another autoimmune disease, you know, or or, or Addison's. Uh, but when you see, you know, Addison's, you have to really think about um, other uh, autoimmune diseases that are, that occur with it. Um, beyond that, other causes are, you know, less common. Um, but in the immunosuppressed population, uh, especially HIV patients, you can see a variety of fungal infections. Tuberculosis still, you know, can occur. I mean, we see this sometimes in immigrant populations more often in some of our hospitals. Um, I've even seen a CMV adrenalitis, again, in a patient with HIV. 
Beyond that, the other causes tend to be less common for primary adrenal insufficiency. So um, the adrenal glands are one of the most common sites of metastases. Uh, you know, I read in a book that it might be like the fifth most common organ that takes metastases of all organs in the body. So you'd have to have bilateral, you know, very large metastases to the adrenals, which happens sometimes that could cause adrenal, primary adrenal insufficiency. Um, and then there are some more rare disorders, you know, for those that our residents are working in the hospital in the ICU, bilateral adrenal hemorrhage due to gram-negative sepsis, et cetera, DIC still occurs and, you know, needs to be high on your differential when you're encountering people who have shock, not responsive suppressors, et cetera, and you check that their cortisol is low. And just one more point, since I used the word Addison's, you know, in that question about the distinguish, the, how to distinguish primary from secondary adrenal sufficiency, this is an important point. The term Addison's disease refers only to primary adrenal insufficiency. So this is commonly not used correctly by patients and many physicians. So, you know, adrenal insufficiency comes in primary and secondary or even tertiary as we discussed. But the term Addison's disease, what Thomas Addison, who described Addison's disease in the 1850s described, was primary adrenal insufficiency. And you could, so in a case like this, you know, where you're seeing this patient has vague symptoms of nausea and weight loss, and you say, you know, you, you see a lot of patients who have these symptoms, then you could look a little further for some other clues as to adrenal insufficiency. So hyperpigmentation is a big one. So looking at, you know, the the patients actually get totally, you know, whole body hyperpigmented. I've seen them. But um, if you look more closely, you'll see in certain areas, like in the palmar creases, the knuckles around the areola, the gums, you'll, you'll, you know, you'll see a lot of hyperpigmentation. So if you want to try to look for things that give you more clues that, you know, than, than just saying this, the person has nausea and vomiting, and I'm just going to check a cortisol on everyone. Another thing you could look at is in primary adrenal insufficiency, there's also mineralocorticoid or aldosterone deficiency. So you're going to see some things like um, salt craving and orthostatic hypotension or more hypotension. And, you know, you could check for those to try to narrow down um, the more specific features to, for who to check for. That was really helpful. I feel like a good reminder of like all those definitions and kind of how they differ. So let's say our patient um, did end up having a prior GI evaluation, including an endoscopy. Labs were notable for sodium of 129, their potassium was 4.9, renal function was normal, hemoglobin was normal, uh, their white blood cell count was 11, they had a mild eosinophilia, and then they did get an AM cortisol, which was checked and was 2.4. So now that we've kind of discussed the symptoms and presentation making us concerned about adrenal insufficiency, can you review the diagnostic testing options and how you work through those. Sure. You know, and, and this case, you know, gives you clues again with the sodium and the potassium. So, you know, again, getting to the point that, you know, in primary care clinics, we see a lot of patients with these nonspecific symptoms, but, you know, people don't have low sodium and high potassium on you all the time. So that, that really should be a, um, a, a wake up call to anyone who sees a patient like this. So by far, the, you know, the first test that one could check or the most useful one would be uh, checking an early morning cortisol. Now, this becomes really important because there's a circadian rhythm. And, you know, this is a common area or pitfall, which I think, you know, we'll talk more about pitfalls later, but you really have to check around 8 or 9 a.m. And in the hospital, this can become a problem because, you know, in one of the hospitals that I used to work at, they'd order a.m. labs and, you know, they'd be drawn really early at 3 a.m. Uh, I don't know how, how it is at other hospitals where you all work at um, so that I guess when, you know, the interns and residents come in in the morning around, they've got their labs to look at. But I promise you that at 3 a.m., our cortisol levels are still very, very low. And that's just normal. <laughs> right. So that ends up being a lot of consults to the inpatient endocrine team. And we, you know, we say, well, let's check again at 8 a.m. or 9 a.m. Um, so, so that's a, a really important point. And the way we look at this, it, you know, it's not as simple as looking at other labs or thyroid labs, for instance. Um, some other l hormones are very stable during the day, but because cortisol is secreted in pulses, um, unless you get levels at extremes on your AM cortisol level, you can't, you know, conclusively have a diagnosis to hang your hat on. So if you get a very low cortisol level and, you know, different people put the cutoff at different levels, usually it's somewhere between three to five micrograms per deciliter. But certainly if you have a morning cortisol, 
under three or four micrograms per deciliter, that's adrenal insufficiency. I mean, that's not normal. And if you have a morning cortisol above 15 micrograms per deciliter, that's such a robust level that that you know effectively rules out adrenal insufficiency. It's those people who have these levels, particularly between 5 and 10 or 5 and 12, is where you really have to think about it. And again, it's because cortisol levels fluctuate. So let's say if, you know I checked the cortisol in this individual in the morning and it came out at 6 micrograms per deciliter. I don't know if that 6 is the peak cortisol you know, of that fluctuation um, or, or you know, this person's making cortisol in a pulsatile manner, just like everyone else, and six was their lowest number that morning. And if I'd happened to check 15 minutes later, I was going to catch a level of 25. So a single level in the morning um, can come out indeterminate when it, when it falls between, you know, around five and 15 micrograms per deciliter. Is the ACTH, is, the, is it okay to draw that at the same time, the 7 to 9 a.m.? I think so. You know, um, this is always a dilemma, I think, for many of us, right? When you, you know, or you're ordering tests and you're not sure if, you know, you, you want to order the second test that you would order as a follow-up to the first test, would it just be more cost-effective to get them at the same time? Mm-hmm. But, you know, it, in many scenarios, it's extremely helpful. And I'll tell you why, especially for primary adrenal insufficiency, um, if you find a very elevated ACTH, even with a quote-unquote normal cortisol level, that's diagnostic of primary adrenal insufficiency. And, uh, you know, again, I'll make uh, the analogy because most doctors are more familiar with the more common thyroid conditions than the rare adrenal conditions. I think we're very familiar with the TSH and it's the same thing, you know, so the TSH is to the thyroid hormone as is ACTH to cortisol. So if you, you know, if any of you saw a patient with a, a low normal thyroid thyroxine T4 hormone and a very high TSH, you would say, yeah, this is hypothyroidism. We call this subclinical hypothyroidism mm-hmm. or early hypothyroidism. Well, it's the same thing with um, cortisol cortisol and ACTH. Um, so if you had a, you know, I'll tell you about a case real quick, many years ago, many moons ago, um, that had a cortisol level of nine, that doesn't seem low, right? But no. the a- yeah, but the ACTH level was 1,200. It's extre- <laughs> extremely high. That sounds, sounds high. high. <laughs> right. And tying into your next question, you know, about the, the, you know, the, the ACTH stimulation test, we did an ACTH stimulation test. Actually, it's not necessary in a case like this, which I'll elaborate on later. But if you do it, and I'll ask you to just imagine, so we gave the patient a high dose of cosyntrope in ACTH. And at 30 minutes and at 60 minutes, we drew the cortisol again, right? And so, the, you know, the interpretation of that is if the cortisol goes up over a certain threshold, usually about above 18, that, you know, the patient doesn't have adrenal insufficiency. Well, I don't know, would anyone, you know, want to guess what the 30 minute and 60 minute cortisol levels were after the high dose of ACTH? Like it couldn't have budged, right? Or am I Absolutely. thinking about this wrong? Because the You're ACTH an endocrinologist, is Paul. High. Amazing. <laughs> You know, <laughs> you don't need me. So exactly. So once <laughs> once the ACTH level is above, above about 300, the adrenal glands are maximally stimulated. So, you know, you could give all the ACTH in the world as a stimulation test. And exactly. So what happened in that case was the 30-minute cortisol level was 9 and the 60-minute cortisol level was 9. And remember, the baseline was 9 too. It didn't budge at all. And so it probably was an unnecessary test. Um, so that's where the ACTH level can be helpful to identify primary adrenal insufficiency. And then also, if you have identified adrenal insufficiency to distinguish primary from secondary, it's absolutely necessary. Um, the, the reason one might argue about not getting it you know, on the first test you're going to check is because if most of the time your cortisol is going to be normal, you know, then you've just gotten an unnecessary ACTH. And ACTH, you know, we might talk about that a little later if we talk about pitfalls. There are issues with ACTH measurements, you know, laboratory artifacts and erroneous mm-hmm. errors, which could then just, you know, result to more unnecessary referrals and chasing your tail. So it may be reasonable if the clinical suspicion is low to moderate, I would say, just check an AM cortisol, because most of the time you're going to get a nice high number and rule it out. Know. And, and let me tell you exactly why this is. Remember, you know, patients who are presenting with weight loss, right? So if anyone has weight loss, and I promise you this, of any cause other than adrenal insufficiency, their cortisol is going to be very high. And I see this because that's the purpose of cortisol. That's why we were created to have cortisol. Cortisol is like an anorexia nervosa. They have very high cortisol, you know, or if you're very sick from cancer, you know, it's a stress hormone. It mobilizes energy stores. So, you know, it, most of these people who don't have adrenal insufficiency that you're suspecting, let's say, because they had these symptoms we talked about that they were ill with weight loss and you check their cortisol, it's going to come out pretty high and you're going to rule it out. The ACTH is going to be unnecessary. But if you do identify a low cortisol, then yes, absolutely, you're going to need to check an ACTH. It's mandatory. Mm -hmm. I was reading that the cosyntropin or the 
uh, the stim test that that there's a couple different doses. And then there's maybe, I, I saw some recommendations you should check at 30 and also at 60 minutes because you can maybe overdiagnose if you just check at the 30 minute time point. Can you talk about what you recommend and or what guidelines recommend? Sure, yeah. The, the common protocol is to um, give a high dose of cosintropin. It's 250 micrograms. That's, you know, the vials come in that dose anyway, so the full vial. Um, and, uh, you know, a nice thing maybe for, for those who might want to be, do this in their office rather than have to send people to the hospitals, it doesn't have to be given IV anymore. So updated guidelines state that you can give it sub-Q or IM, which is really wonderful. And the full protocol is to check a baseline level, you know, give the injection, and get a 30 and 60 minute value. And you know, to the question about the 30 versus 60 minute value, um, the cortisol increases by 30 minutes, but it goes even higher by 60 minutes. Uh, so that's probably why you know you read that you may um, uh, miss some cases by checking you know the, only the 30 minute value. Uh, again, you know, I, I'm at liberty to tell you um, a simple way to do it for doctors in their own office because doing a full protocol i realize is not practical for many people if you're not an endocrinologist with a setup to do it but it's totally okay believe me to do as a screen as a down and dirty test and i've done this many times a simple test where you could give the dose i am which i think everyone can do in their office one dose and have the patient go i would say anytime from 30 to 60 minutes later so i don't even make it you know so strict so be mm -hmm. 45 minutes later if you want, and do a single blood draw. And if you get a cortisol level above 19 micrograms per deciliter, that goes a long way in, you know, in ruling out um, adrenal insufficiency. So that's sort of you know, the, the easy way of doing the test, not the full protocol. But 90% you know, of the time, you get such a robust response in most people that you've ruled it out. Yeah, could there be some times where you're like, well, you know, I got a, a result that was very borderline. I, I did this down and dirty test that, you know, Attil told me about, and I got a cortisol level of 17 micrograms from deciliter, you know, close to the cutoff. I wonder if I'd done the full protocol, you know, if I would have gotten a higher number. Um, yeah, that happens every now and then. And so if that happens, then, you know, you could refer to an endocrinologist or send those people for a full protocol. Um, the low dose test you asked about isn't done very often. The low dose test is a one microgram. So if you remember what I said a minute ago, the high dose test is 250 micrograms, which is the full oh, yeah. vial. So diluting a 250 microgram to one microgram is not easy. Um, it's not going to be done in the clinic by the nurse. I'll tell you that. So it could be done in a hospital <laughs> setting where the pharmacy prepares it and sends it up and they're not usually happy to do it. Um, whether it provides any incremental benefit is of some debate, but there were some original studies that, you know, weren't always reproduced in additional studies that suggested that for secondary adrenal sufficiency, that the test may have a higher sensitivity, which I believe is true. And you know, let me just explain that really quick. The, the issue with the cosintropin stim test in general, whether it's high dose or low dose, is that it's very good for diagnosing primary adrenal sufficiency. So remember, you're injecting ACTH, so you're stimulating the adrenal. If the adrenal's dead, so to speak, if it's not functioning, um, if, it's, if it's diseased, it's not going to respond. But in secondary adrenal sufficiency, so these patients who, let's say, have a pituitary problem and they're not quite making enough ACTH, if you blast those patients with a really high dose of ACTH, their adrenal may be able to respond to that. You know, so it will give some false negatives. Its sensitivity, you know, is around 64% or something for picking up the diagnosis. So some patients with secondary adrenal sufficiency will quote unquote pass their, you know, high dose cosintropin stim test. But if you do a low dose cosintropin stim test, um, their adrenals have, you know, have atrophied from not being stimulated by the pituitary for a long time. So they won't increase quite as much with the low dose. Um, so, so the idea was that the low dose may be better for secondary adrenal sufficiency, whereas the high dose is, mm -hmm. is, is more ideal for primary adrenal sufficiency. Yeah, I might I might send people to endocrinology if I'm worried about that nuance. <laughs> right. Yes. <laughs> I but think that... in general for adrenal insufficiency, I mean, you know, there there are certain things that I we appreciate primary doctors manage, including you know di many diabetes and thyroid sure. patients. Adrenal insufficiency, you know, I think once it's been diagnosed, it's good to have an endocrinologist involved, you know, at least from time to time and see these patients and keep an eye mm -hmm. on them. Yeah. I think we wanted to talk a little bit more about um, pitfalls here, right, Elena? Yeah, yeah. I think that'd be helpful. So if, if I know you've brought some up, but what are common pitfalls with these diagnostic tests for adrenal right, yeah. insufficiency? 
Yeah, so, you know, the first one is what I'd mentioned about the time of day. Um, and, you know, I, I alluded to that in the hospital and, you know, the 3 a.m. blood draws, but also be careful for shift workers. You know, so if someone is nocturnal or, you know, ask them about or I don't know, college students who are waking up at noon, it may be more reasonable to check around the time. Cortisol is the, the get up and go hormone, so to speak. So it peaks right around the time we wake up. So measuring it around their, you know, the time that they wake up. Um, other pitfalls could be in individuals who have um, low albumin or low cortisol binding globulin states. So, you know, like someone with liver disease or in the hospital, again, this happens, people are septic, in the ICU, sometimes if they have very low albumin, they also have low cortisol binding globulin. So just to, you know, elaborate on that um, for our listeners, uh, remember that for many hormones, we've gotten away from measuring total hormone levels. You know, we tell you don't measure total thyroid measure free T4 levels. And for testosterone, even now, you know, we're measuring free testosterone. So cortisol being a steroid hormone is lipophilic and carried in the circulation by, by protein carrier. And it's called cortisol binding globulin or CBG. But in individuals who, you know, have liver disease or other, you know, low protein states, uh, like uh, an acute phase, sepsis, etc., cetera, um, their cortisol binding globulin levels are low. So you get falsely low total cortisol levels. You can measure free cortisol, so you could send it, but it's not run very often. So it'll take a good week to get the result. Um, and you know, usually this sort of stuff, patient is hospitalized, um, uh, so it's not that helpful. There are protocols for using albumin as a surrogate marker of the CBG, the cortisol binding globulin, and to correct for it. And, you know, I could share literature, but, you know, as a rule of thumb, for instance, you know, there's a very nice New England Journal article where they came up with a formula for this. If an individual's serum albumin level was under um, two, they suggested that using a cortisol of 12 as, you know, rather than 18 as the cutoff for the cosyntropin stimulated, you know, or peak or mm -hmm. adequate cortisol. Um, another pitfall or, you know, area, since we're speaking of this could be, you know, again, for individuals who are in the hospital, if you're seeing a patient who's septic or in, in the ICU, that, that sort of sick, septic shock, et cetera, you don't need to do a cosyntropin test. I mean, the whole idea of the ACTH stim test is to replicate what would happen during a severe stress to the body. So if the body's already under such a severe stress that you're in shock or sepsis, you're maximally stimulated. So you can just measure a random cortisol any time of the day if someone's that sick on pressors, et cetera. And if it's under 18 micrograms per deciliter, that's you know inadequate and, and you could consider giving them glucocorticoid um, physiologic you know, or stress dose replacement in those cases. Uh, and then the other pitfall, I alluded to this a little bit earlier too, is that we do have some recognized some issues with the ACTH assay. Particularly, there's a um, problem with a single platform that gives a lot of erroneous, usually high, but occasionally low readings. And this has been a problem for the community. So if you're seeing, you know, for some reason, a patient who had an ACTH measured and it just doesn't make any sense, it doesn't fit with anything, <laughs> um, that might be a time to send them to a different lab and check it again. At the Williams technique. Yeah, the Williams. <laughs> right. Yeah. Just keep checking until you like the answer. Yeah. I love it. You know, one one other point though. On the other end, this is actually you know kind of, it may be important to let people know um, about the cortisol binding globulin issue. A lot of women are on oral estrogen. You know, whether it's birth control pills, you know, postmenopausal estrogen isn't as common as it used to be. But you know, women on birth control pills, oral contraceptives and oral estrogen really increases. Um, CBG levels from the liver. So you'll see very high serum cortisol levels. This is usually a consult for us on the other end. So someone checked the cortisol and it came out 30 or 40. And it, that's just normal in a woman who's on birth control. If you check their free cortisol, it's normal. But because the binding protein is elevated, um, you get this you know, artifact that you can see. But this could also affect your interpretation on the lower end for the diagnosis of adrenal insufficiency. So you know, theoretically, they could have adrenal insufficiency with a cortisol measuring seven, uh, whereas you know, if, if they hadn't been on birth control, their cortisol was actually three, which I told you was low earlier. Mm -hmm. So you know, remember the birth control effect that it causes an artifact to you know, almost double 50% to you know, 70% increase in serum cortisol measurements. Can you because can you remind us because I was I was mentioning to you that sometimes when these patients let's say it was the patient that was in the hospital that was septic and they checked a random cortisol and it came back at like nine or something and they discern they determined that patient had adrenal insufficiency and now we're seeing them in primary care uh, but this person's taking hydrocortisone how do we handle testing in those in those kind of cases. You know, that's a very um, interesting situation, and, and we see it a lot. We don't know exactly why that happens, where some individuals get this relative adrenal insufficiency that's, you know, transient 
usually during like a gram negative sepsis or something in yeah. the hospital, most of them will recover. So you will be able to take most of them off. So all you need to do in that case is check an 8 a.m. cortisol. But what you need to do is check it before they take their dose of hydro if they're taking hydrocortisone or whatever they're taking mm -hmm. because hydrocortisone is cortisol so they're synonyms it's the same molecule we just for some reason we call it cortisol when we talk about it in the body and hydrocortisone when we give it as a drug um, so if someone swallows their hydrocortisone and you measure their cortisol after you're just measuring the level in the drug basically that's getting absorbed you're proving that um, so but if you measure their morning level before they take their morning dose as long as they haven't taken any hydrocortisone by mouth for 12 to 16 hours it, you know it's all the previous dose is washed out and then you know everything that i we talked about earlier applies so if their cortisol is under three or five they're still low so they need to be replaced and maybe they should see an endocrinologist if it's above 15 you can just stop you know if you're sure that that the level was measured before they took their hydrocortisone and you got a level of above 15 15 in that patient, we just stop their hydrocortisone, tell them mm -hmm. you're no, you're making enough cortisol you know, you don't need it anymore. And if it comes out in that kind of five to 10 range or so that that person may need further evaluation with the stim test. And again, maybe an endocrinologist should take a look at that case to see, you know, why do they have adrenal insufficiency and, and for long-term suggestions on what to do. Okay. Oh, this is, this is fantastic. Very, very helpful. Yeah. Uh, Elena, let's, let's get on to the next part of the case. Cause I think we have a little bit more diagnostic for primary adrenal insufficiency we wanted to go through? Yeah. So our patient does end up getting an ACTH level checked as well, which is elevated at 1000. Normal's like 7 to 63, uh, consistent with primary adrenal insufficiency. So we've talked some about what are potential causes for primary adrenal insufficiency. So in this patient or in most patients, what further evaluation is recommended to determine the etiology. So, yeah, as we stated, the most common cause is autoimmune. And just like in many autoimmune diseases, we have an autoantibody that you can check in the serum. Uh, and in this case, it's called the 21-hydroxylase antibody. <laughs> that's the name of an enzyme. Anyone remembers from medical school in the adrenal glands that's involved in steroid synthesis, et cetera. <laughs> Bad so, flashbacks. <laughs> right, right. So, you know, one could look that up. You know, depending on what electronic health record you look, if you type in things like adrenal autoantibody panel, or sometimes it comes up as just hydroxylase antibody. But that's going to be, you know, the first step. And again, you know, this, the, the, you know, these sorts of cases, I think if you, one were to identify a patient like this, they should certainly be referred to an endocrinologist and they could, you know, take over the evaluation. But a few things I'll point out is that about 80% of patients with autoimmune adrenalitis have positive antibodies. So like, for instance, in this patient, if the antibody test came out negative, they still have auto. I mean, this patient had hypothyroidism and celiac disease and is a young woman, and it's just got to be autoimmune, you know. So you may look a little bit further, but um, about 20% of patients with proven autoimmune adrenalitis might have negative antibodies. So that's an interesting thing to, to, to know about. The other point about the antibodies is the longer out you go from the time of diagnosis, the more people sort of seroconvert to net negative. So, you know, by, like by five or 10 years after diagnosis, only 70% of patients still have positive antibodies. So they, they may lose the as the disease kind of burns out, so to speak. Um, if the antibodies are negative, the guidelines suggest imaging the adrenals in most of the patients at that point, uh, because you may find the other rare causes in those people, which mostly have some abnormalities on imaging, like masses of their adrenals. And those could be metastases, you know, or bilateral adrenal tumors, infiltrative diseases that we had talked about in the immunocompromised individuals, fungal infections, tuberculosis, et cetera, and then rarely bilateral adrenal hemorrhage. There is this one unique, again, this becomes very esoteric too, other part you know, of thing to test. If you ever see a young man you know, who has primary adrenal insufficiency and uh, their hydroxylase antibody is negative, there's this, you know, I don't know if anyone remembers this from studying or whatever people just, study Just for, for this episode, uh, that yes. I, I had totally forgot this. Right. Do you remember what it is? It's so adrenal is leukodystrophy. Very, very Adre light chain. Is this? Yeah, very, very long, light chain. A very, yeah, very long, long chain. chain. Yeah, very long chain fatty acids. So and there's even a movie about this. If for those movie buffs out there, I didn't mention in my hobbies that I love movies a lot. So there's this movie called Lorenzo's Oil with, was it Susan Sarandon and Nick Nolte or something? I, you know, um, about a story about this disease. But it's also a neurodegenerative disease. And I guess the idea is that if you pick it up early based on this adrenal finding, that maybe, you know, you could intervene and treat. I'm not a neurologist or don't know that well or, you know, to slow down the development of the neurodegenerative process. But that's just this one little And that was that, adrenoleukodystrophy. I think adrenal I over-talked when you were saying it the first time. Right, so that right. 
Yeah. Uh, definitely had no memory of that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's, and I think this is probably the, you know, the least common thing that one would run into. But, you know, the question is, the first thing is we check the 21 hydroxylase antibodies and we might image the adrenals. And in a young man who's presenting with, you know, a primary adrenal sufficiency, negative antibody test, you know, the guidelines say to check that very mm. long chain fatty acids. It's orderable through commercial labs. I've sent it a few times and seen one or two cases. Mm -hmm. If I even tried to order that, my current EHR, I would die of old age before I find it. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I just want to, I want to do a little bit of a recap. We've talked about so much and I know we're going to talk, get into uh, like the replacement, uh, like the treatment next. But so we talked about how there's the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis. If, if people's adrenals are not making cortisol, that's the primary type. Uh, in practice, we, we generally lump secondary and tertiary together because we don't necessarily kn always know if it's the pituitary or the hypothalamus, which is, you know, not doing its, its job in this case. Um, with primary, they have high ACTH and low morning cortisol, usually under three to five. And with secondary or tertiary, they have an ACTH that could be low or it could be inappropriately normal and the cortisol would be low in those cases. Uh, we talked about it's between 7 and 9 a.m. when you want to check the cortisol. Uh, if it's above 15, probably rules it out. And as I already said, 3 to 5 is the cutoff if it's below that. 3 to 5 is the cutoff for saying we probably think this is adrenal insufficiency. And then if it's between the two, those between 5 and 15, that's where we're thinking about this ACTH stim test. And uh, the standard dose is 250 micrograms, which uh, can be given sub-Q, IM, or IV. And then we check baseline 30 and 60 minute labs. And uh, we want to see it go above 19 to say that this person doesn't have adrenal insufficiency. And uh, we talked about sometimes in the secondary, and this is probably something that we'd be asking your help for, Atil. In secondary, they might do a lower dose where they give a one microgram stim test. Uh, for people with secondary adrenal insufficiency to see if they truly have it or not. And some of the pitfalls, just look out for people with very low albumin or liver disease. Um, they might just have a low total cort cortisol, but maybe a normal free cortisol that we're missing. And then uh, women who are pregnant or on oral contraceptives, they have very high binding globulin, so their cortisol can look normal. Maybe we have to have a, a higher cutoff for uh, what we consider normal. Let's see. I'm running out of steam on this recap. We've gone through a lot. Oh. <laughs> You're doing great, buddy. <laughs> uh, we'll stop there because I think, as I said, I'm running out of steam on this recap. But we have we have to talk about how to treat our patient here because we've diagnosed this patient with primary adrenal insufficiency. So, Elena, what's the next part of the case here? Yeah, so I, I know that we will probably ask for endocrinology's help with this. So, Etiel, how would you determine... Like the initial dosing of steroids to treat this patient with and when to add things like fludrocortisone. So, so at this stage, this patient has full-blown primary adrenal sufficiency or Addison's disease, and they need, you know, both glucocorticoid and mineralocorticoid replacement. You know, it's, it's pretty obvious. So you're going to need to treat them with hydrocortisone and fludrocortisone. So we can talk about those, you know, individually. Generally, we focus more on the glucocorticoid. And one point I'd like to make is that, you know, in recent years, guidelines have come out saying that we should almost always, you know, prefer hydrocortisone. And the reason I say that, and I don't know if you know, you've all seen this before, is that we used to sometimes use prednisone or dexamethasone. And because prednisone and dexamethasone are, you know, much more potent with a longer half-life, um, that seemed to make them attractive to some people for some reasons, but they're metabolized in the liver very, very differently among different people. So you can get into a lot of inter-individual problems with, you know, overdosing much more than you thought you were giving, you know, getting a lot more glucocorticoid effect mm -hmm. or less with those. And, you know, to the point of people use terms like bioidentical hormone, et cetera, um, hydrocortisone is cortisol. It's the most physiologic, you know, way we can replace the actual hormone that's deficient. Um, hydrocortisone has a shorter half-life though. So, you know, when you give an oral dose, probably by about eight to 10 hours, almost, you know, all of its effect is gone. So we usually dose it at least twice a day. So probably 90% of people take it twice a day. If you can take it three times a day, 
it's even better. And you know, I, I would say up to a quarter of my patients really do feel better with thrice daily dosing than twice. The way you dose it isn't that you know intuitive. It's a body surface area calculation. So if anyone wanted to, you know, know how to do it, so we Paul do. Paul knows this in his head. Just give him. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Well, you know, it's a passion of mine. Actually, yeah, it's not. You know, just to tell you uh, honestly how how I do it. I don't know, obviously, of you know, body surface area. But it's, if you just Google body surface area calculator, you just put in a person's height and their weight, you know, and um, and it comes up. It gives you a number, and it you, usually what we dose is eight to ten milligrams per meter square. So what that means is that the average person, you know, the size range of people we see, their, their total daily dose is going to going to be between 15 milligrams to 30 milligrams of hydrocortisone um, in that range, you know, people weighing between 50 to 100 kilograms or, you know, 100 to 200 pounds, et cetera, are the doses. And you're going to give the bigger dose in the morning, just replicating the normal biorhythm or circadian rhythm of cortisol production. So let's say we would give 10 milligrams in the morning and five milligrams, usually in the middle of the afternoon, because by nighttime, um, cortisol levels dip very low and it actually allows us to sleep. If your cortisol remains high at night or if you take your hydrocortisone dose too late at night, many people have insomnia as a result. Um, so that would be a typical you know, way of starting the dose. Um, it, a really interesting thing, and you'll probably ask me about following um, patients, is that there is really no exactly right way to know what the right dose for a person is, as opposed to anything else we do in endocrinology, where among all types of doctors, we love to measure everything. We measure the heck out of the TSH and the glucose and titrate and titrate our insulin and our synthroid and our levothyroxine and all these things. With um, hydrocortisone replacement, there's really no lab value you're titrating it to. So you're not, you know, you can't give the hydrocortisone and measure something like a blood or urine cortisol to tell you where you're at. So one expert in this field said, sometimes you just have to be a doctor. And I really love that. What, what he means is, you know, you <laughs> oh, can't no. stop just <laughs> adjusting everything to labs, which we love to do, as I said, as endocrinologists, and look at your patient and know what you're looking for. And so this is one of the reasons, it, you know, I think endocrinologists should manage these patients because you need to learn the subtle signs of glucocorticoid excess you know, some things that could occur, like even just the blood pressure, or the glucose starting to creep up or people getting very slightly cushingoid on you that you might not, you know, their cheeks getting redder and rounder, little bruises on their skin is a, is a sure tail, you know, a, a hallmark of excess glucocorticoid exposure. Um, and then if you're not giving enough, they'll have a, you know, exacerbation of their original adrenal sufficiency symptoms, such as fatigue and anorexia, weight loss, et cetera, nausea. Um, the flutrocortisone, actually, we do have a little bit more labs that we can follow. So, you know, the flutrocortisone is recommended in the guidelines that pretty much all patients should be, you know, put on flutrocortisone. And this is one of the areas of a little bit of debate among experts. Uh, but the guidelines did come out and state that we should try to do this. And flutrocortisone replaces aldosterone, which is also deficient in patients with primary adrenal sufficiency, but not in secondary adrenal sufficiency. Mm -hmm. So this is a very important point. So in patients with secondary adrenal sufficiency, they're only low in cortisol. The Part of the adrenal gland called the zona glomerulosa that makes aldosterone is regulated by the kidney and the renin angiotensin system. So if your pituitary and hypothalamus don't work, it doesn't matter. You'll still make enough aldosterone. Um, but for primary, since this case has primary adrenal sufficiency, remember she had low sodium, she had high potassium or high-ish potassium. To fix those problems, you need to give some um, fludrocortisone. The starting dose of that is usually 0.1 milligrams, but the dose range is 0 0.05 to 0 0.2 milligrams. And, you know, we asked about the dose. And then you follow the patient. You know, if you're giving too much, they'll get edematous and hypokalemic and hypertension. And if you're not giving enough, they'll have the opposite issues with orthostatic hypotension. Salt craving is a big one. So if you're seeing patients with primary adrenal insufficiency and you want to ask them a question in clinic, ask them about salt craving. If you're not giving enough fluid cortisone, they tend to crave a lot of salt and put a lot of salt on everything. And the lab tests we can use to help us titrate, you know, our fluid cortisone beyond you know, looking at their blood pressure and for edema, et cetera, and their symptoms is their potassium and sodium. But also, and again, I'm not suggesting primary doctors do this, but as endocrinologists, we look at that test called the plasma renin activity. Um, because if you think about it, if you're giving too much fluid cortisone, it'll suppress the renin activity. And if you're not giving enough, they'll have a high plasma renin activity. Uh, you know, I, I, don't, I don't need to explain that too much, but it's a good guide to tell you about your fluid cortisone dose. Um, we've the, we've the, gone deep on the adrenal gland recently, <laughs> right, right, so we're, yeah. you, you, <laughs> our audience is our, yeah our audience is well well on uh you know at least testing aldo and renin for uh for hypertension purposes right. you know for those right. for hypertensive patients we're used to yeah. looking at it not not in this specific situation but 
uh, it's, it's similar. So uh, this is great. I mean, th- the question I had about this, um, th- there's a lot of doses. So it, it seems like we should just probably have them at least one visit with an endocrinologist. Like I, cause the dose range is pretty variable for both hydrocortisone and fludrocortisone from what I was reading. And at, I think the tips that you're giving us are good for us to even send them, Hey, I saw them, they're having edema. Do you think I should go down on their hydrocort or their, their fludrocortisone dose? You know, that sort of thing. I think these tips you gave us are good. But uh, it, it seems like we would probably want an endocrinologist help at least the first, you know, when the person's Absolutely. first being started on these medications. I think so. I think for these patients, it really makes a difference. And did I, did I read that DHEA is also something people are thinking about giving and that that's maybe that's a controversial thing? I, do you think that's worth talking about or is that something we could talk about giving? it, you know, very briefly. Um, DHA is an androgen hormone, you know, similar to testosterone and it's made in the adrenal. So the first thing I'll point out is that there's really no point of exploring it much in men with primary adrenal insufficiency or adrenal insufficiency um, because, you know, as long as men have testes that are, you know, uh, are functioning, um, they have plenty of testosterone. So the DHEA androgen effect is very weak and it's a drop in the bucket. So it's not going to make a difference. But maybe if there is a role for considering it, it could be in women with adrenal insufficiency. And DHEA will be low in both primary and secondary. So it's an ACTH dependent hormone. Um, the literature is not s- strongly in support of this. So it's not something by any means we do with every patient. But if you've kind of done everything you can with the the, the hydrocortisone and fludrocortisone and you know and, and the patients are still having various symptoms such as weakness, you know, easy fatigability with their muscles with exercise and especially maybe libido and motivation, those sorts of things, it may be worth a try. Well that's that's great. Uh, that that's very helpful. I think the other thing we should probably talk about are sick rules, you know, so we, let's say we've got our person on uh, 20 milligrams hydrocortisone and point something of fludrocortisone. (laughs) Uh, Tell us how you might tell them to adjust that based on um, they get a gastroenteritis. What, right, what yeah. are you telling them? This to is do? the single most important thing. So, you know, we teach our endocrinology fellows and endocrinologists that at every visit and, you know, even nurses, et cetera, in our clinics to be on top of this, to remind people about stress dose education. And what we do for them is, uh, you know, there's some very nice guides on this. Um, and I guess I'm allowed to put in a plug for a patient, you know, driven organization called the National Adrenal Disease Foundation. And they have a really wonderful website called nadf.us, nadf.us. And honestly, what I do is, and, and I recommend to anyone who's listening, if they needed resources on this, rather than try to memorize all this or have everything, they have, you know, one page sheets on all of these situations that you could think about. And oh, I wow. print it out, right? Because, you know, you can imagine the number of calls we get, you know, I got a toothache, I'm going to go to the dentist, I have a cold, but I don't have a fever, you know, what do I do? The first thing I'll say about this is there's very, very little evidence based behind these recommendations. So this is based on expert opinion and the best we can do. But, you know, the guide that I give the patient says that if you have a temperature up to a certain number, and I forget exactly what it was, I think it was like a 101.3, you know, that to double your daily dose of um, hydrocortisone for two or three days or until your fever's gone. And if it's above that, to triple your daily dose. So what we're trying to do is mimic the body's natural strength stress response that when we're sick, that we, you know, increase our cortisol production. And obviously these individuals aren't able to do that since their HPA axis in some way isn't working and their adrenal gland isn't working. So, you know, th- they would need to be able to stress those hydrocortisone for usually for febrile illness, sometimes for very severe physical exertion. So, so for people who are, you know, working out in the heat or marathon runners or something may sometimes benefit if it's been more than four hours since their hydrocortisone dose, an extra little bump of five milligrams of hydrocortisone. And then it has a number of written recommendations based on the type of procedure they're going to do, whether it's a colonoscopy or, as I mentioned, dental work, et cetera. Mm-hmm. Um, but again, there's very little you know, evidence base. And I can't tell you how many times I've seen people who forgot to do this. And generally, they're fine until they're not. You know, So it's not something you want to take too much of a risk with. Um, and you want to give the patients these recommendations. The other two things that are super important for these patients is to have them obtain a medic alert bracelet. And again, the nadf.us website has a very nice little guide and an order form and things and, you know, what it should say. We, we have it say, you know, adrenal insufficiency, adrenal insufficiency needs stress dose steroids. So some sort of an engraving or a card. And then, you know, th- this is the latest thing that we do for people is we give everyone a home 
hydrocortisone emergency injection kit. And we found this to be so important because we used to just tell people, if you're so sick that you need an injection, and when would that be? It's when you can't take pills. So if you've got a stomach bug, you know, viral gastroenteritis or food poisoning, vomiting, diarrhea, you can get very dehydrated and hypotensive. And if you have adrenal insufficiency, it's that much worse. You know, you can go into shock. So, the, you know, in those cases, they we have them give themselves uh, an emergency injection at home and, and we give them all instructions, you know, whether it's in writing or there's YouTube videos now or have yeah. our nurse teach them how to do that. Um, and, and uh, you many tell them people you take that and then go into the ER and then go to the ER because they're probably going to need assessment in IV fluids. The problem that's happened, and this is why this program is so important. If anyone listening today just you know remembers nothing else today, just remember this because we see this. You know these patients go to the ER and they they're like you know the people there just look at me puzzled like what do you mean adrenal insufficiency? You need hydrocortisone or it just takes so long like they're waiting in the waiting room. So we tell them to just take matters into their own hands and give themselves the shot, and they usually immediately feel so much better after that injection um, and then go to the, go to urgent care to the ER. Yeah. I think that one of the, there, there was a Lancet seminar paper that was fairly recent uh, that had some good uh, rules about this too. Um, and they were, they were also mentioning there's like a hydrocortisone support or no prednisolone suppository or right. some sort of suppository there as is. well. I'm not sure uh, if that's something you prescribe as well. Yeah, I haven't, but I have read about it. Um, and I haven't seen too many of my colleagues using it, but it actually mm -hmm. seems to make sense, especially for people who in that situation, I mean, it's easy to talk about taking a shot when you're very sick, but maybe not everyone is going to be feeling up to it or have someone around that you knows trained on it. So a suppository seems to make a lot of sense. Yeah. Okay. So we're, so basically they're doubling their dose if their temperature is kind of a little bit high. And if it's really high, they're tripling their dose. And how long are they staying on that elevated dose? Typically, how long do you typically? Yeah, usually it's two that? or three days, unless mm -hmm. they have a protracted illness, in which case, and then they would, they would need to continue. Let's say if they had a bad pneumonia or something, some people may need to stay on it four or five days or longer. Yeah, but it's usually two or three days is what's recommended. Okay. And my sense is kind of low threshold to increase someone's dose if we're unsure and we think they're in a stressed state. And Absolutely. Okay. There are times where I have people who are just feeling really bad and I can't figure out why why they are. And I'll tell them, just you know, try doubling your, your hydrocortisone dose for two or three days and then go back down. And then just let me know what the, you know, just as a little experiment to understand, is this even related in any way to their, you know, their cortisol oh, cool. dosing? Um, yeah, that's, that that's a smart, that's a smart way to go about it. Okay, so for our second case, we have a 32-year-old male, has a history of ulcerative colitis, had a colectomy two months prior, and he's presenting to clinic now with fatigue and lightheadedness. His blood pressure in clinic's 96 over 50. He was previously on steroids for his ulcerative colitis intermittently for years and kind of more consistently prior to the colectomy. They were discontinued with a short taper following the colectomy. So... Thinking about our concern for adrenal insufficiency in this patient, kind of how long after exposure to steroids should we be concerned about secondary adrenal insufficiency? And what would you do next for him? Yeah, so there's a great degree of variability in um, the sensitivity of the HPA axis to glucocorticoids. So, you know, it means that there's some people with, you know, who have slightly less glucocorticoid, exogenous glucocorticoid exposure, steroid exposure, and they get adrenally insufficient, and some people who seem to be more resistant to it. But as a rule of thumb, what's said is that if a person's been on more than about equivalent of 7.5 to 10 milligrams of prednisone for more than two to three, you know, usually three weeks or more is when you should be concerned about, you know, more clinically relevant suppression of the HPA axis of adrenal insufficiency upon abrupt withdrawal. So you know, the whole point here is, you know, who needs to taper and go a little more slowly to allow their adrenals to wake back up, so to speak, so they don't get very symptomatic from their adrenal insufficiency. So it'd be you no know, more than 7.5 milligrams of prednisone for more than three weeks. And it might be helpful to, you know, review dose equivalencies of steroids, you know, so because we talk about hydrocortisone, prednisone, and dexamethasone, for instance. And you know, the way we think about that is that prednisone is about four times more potent than hydrocortisone. So, you know, one milligram of prednisone is equal to four milligrams of hydro if you had you know hydrocortisone. And then dexamethasone is extremely you know, it's potent. So it's it's 25 times more potent than hydrocortisone, plus it has a super long duration of action. Um, these all need to be taken into consideration. 
Yeah, that is, I, I feel like dexamethasone, we're just like, yeah, give them four milligrams every every six hours and they're good right. to go. You, and, and just not thinking about how much steroid that actually is. Yeah, it lasts over a day, you know. Um, the half-life is like 30 hours or something. So I don't even know why we need to dose it every four or every six hours when we sometimes do that. But that's the tradition. Oh, man. I think tradition is the answer why we do that. <laughs> yeah. I, think, I think that's the answer. So w- what about patients who... Say this patient was still on steroids, but had these symptoms. How do you think about like just a decrease in their dose causing? Yeah. So this is actually a big um, problem, I think, for some of us in endocrinology in terms of our relationship with referring doctors. So, you know, you might have to bear with me as I explain this because um, this creates issues in patient satisfaction with referrals and our satisfaction with referrals too. So if a person's already on you know, like this patient on steroids to treat some underlying condition, for instance, ulcerative colitis, some inflammatory autoimmune condition. And as you're tapering them down, if they're feeling bad, there's actually three possible things that could be going on that explains it. And only one of them is for the endocrinologist. Okay. So, so the reason we taper steroids, you know, is threefold. Um, And so, you know, the first one is that their underlying disease state could be exacerbating. So that's the most frustrating for us when they refer patients to us, and especially if they're still on supraphysiological doses. So, you know, you shouldn't be sending to the endocrinologist unless they're down to somewhere closer to five milligrams of prednisone, because if you're feeling bad with, you know, 10 milligrams or more of prednisone, that can't be adrenal insufficiency. You've got way more than enough glucocorticoids in your system to replace cortisol deficiency. So, you know, we only get involved. Adrenal insufficiency means that the, the amount of cortisol effect in the body is lower than physiologic. So there's something else. The, you know, the second scenario is the one where we would want to get involved. And let's say you got the person all the way down to, you know, five milligrams or somewhere close to five milligrams, seven milligrams, you know, of prednisone. And now they're starting to have symptoms of, you know, fatigue and weakness and nausea and weight loss looks like adrenal sufficiency. That's where we can intervene. And you know, I can explain more about what we can do in that situation. To, that's adrenal insufficiency. The third one is one that I think might surprise you that a lot of people don't know about that we're really interested in these days. And it's called glucocorticoid withdrawal syndrome. So glucocorticoids are a drug. They're a very potent drug on the brain. And as you cut down on glucocorticoids, some people go through a drug withdrawal. And it's, you know, it's a very challenging thing. And differentiating this out from the symptoms, you know, it may be easier in someone with colitis, you know, let alone the colectomy that happened in this case. But, you know, what what symptoms are exacerbating? If they're symptoms of their colitis, well, that's easy. Then, you know, that's obviously not for the endocrinologist. It's for the gastroenterologist. But for some conditions, it's not so clear. You know, some of the rheumatological conditions, patients with uh, lupus and other things also feel like achy and fatigued. But you know what? Um, Glucocorticoid withdrawal and even sometimes adrenal insufficiency is kind of achy and fatigued, you know, (laughs) and trying to figure out what's what um, is very challenging and trying to explain this to, you know, referring doctors, let alone patients. And, you know, they just want to feel better, but, you know, we can't really do much as the endocrinologist unless they're already down to physiologic doses. And the issue is, you know, physiologic deficiency of cortisol that we can kind of address. Um, So how, uh, Atil, how do those cases normally resolve? Let's say it's the patient who is five milligrams. Someone told them to just take five for a week and then stop and they felt really bad and they went back on five and now they're coming to you like, how do we get this pa- person off steroids? Well, <laughs> is it, well, think, is it yeah. just is it just sort of like you just try to go a milligram a month and then if they feel bad, you you back off for a while and let them stay at four milligrams and then when they, when you want to try again, you go down to three and just kind of, it just takes as long as it takes or, you know, that's a very reasonable approach for everyone except for the endocrinologist. <laughs> um, and that's, you know, and that's totally fine. And I think that, you know, and, and rheumatologists and other types of doctors, you know, prescribe and do this all the time. So you could ask them, but you know, there's no way you're going to see an endocrinologist with, without us measuring the hormone, right? So oh. everything we talked about earlier, what am I going to do? I'm going to measure their cortisol because, you know, there's some people they come in, okay, you know, you're on five milligrams and let's say, you got them to four milligrams and three milligrams. That's not enough. I, I, you know, I explained just five minutes ago that you have to be on more than seven and a half milligrams for more than three weeks to suppress your HPA axis. That's you're an, a no longer on doses that are suppressive. So I might measure their morning cortisol and I get a really robust level, 20 micrograms per deciliter. And I show it to the patient and I say, listen, this isn't like, you know, you're this, this isn't adrenal insufficiency. 
It might be something else. You know, it's really important to point out steroids can make us all feel better. Like, you know, steroids inherently have feel better properties. They were the wonder drug when they came out 60 years ago. So just the fact that like you feel better when you take steroids doesn't mean you have adrenal insufficiency. So, so what we would do would be we would measure the cortisol. Now it is going to be low in most of the patients, right? So, yeah. you know, um, right. So if it is low, what we do and what you'll see our endocrinology colleagues do is switch them over to hydrocortisone because it's much weaker. It's not as potent. It's much shorter acting. It's much easier to come off of. If you put someone on dexamethasone, I promise you, you're never going to get them off of it. It's so long <laughs> acting. Never. Even on 0.25, you know, I've seen it. It's 10 years. The minute you switch them to hydrocortisone, you, you know, so the hydrocortisone is in and out. And when you dose it twice a day overnight, there's very little cortisol in the body while they're asleep. That you know, shuts off that negative feedback and provides an impetus for the hypothalamus and pituitary to start generating those ACTH pulses again. So that's how you're going to um, do it is put them on hydrocortisone, check their morning cortisol periodically. It could be every month, every couple of months. And as that starts to come up, taper down the hydrocortisone. And if needed, you know, all the numbers that we talked about earlier in the, today's uh, podcast apply with the cortisol levels of what we consider low and normal and the cosyntropin. You can, again, still use the cosyntropin test. Um, at some point to identify when their adrenals have recovered and then tell them, you know, congratulations. Now, this is all by the book, by numbers. You know, patients don't read the books or, you know, care about the numbers. They care about how they feel. So sometimes um, we have to modify the regimen and give more steroids for longer than we'd want to because the patient just feels awful and we don't know why, even though their cortisol levels are, mm -hmm. are improved. Can I just check to make sure I'm understanding? So if if it's the patient that's on five of prednisone, and you check a morning cortisol and it's 19, you can just stop the prednisone and just you say, You can just stop it. Okay. And then, yeah. but, it, but if their cortisol is like three or if, if their cortisol is three, we can put them on hydrocortisone and then we can work the taper from what, with them being on hydrocortisone as Absolutely. if they're having secondary right. adrenal insufficiency. Okay. That would be a starting point. Yeah. Yeah. And if they're... If they're mid range, like let's say their their the cortisol level is nine or something, if you were decided you wanted to do the 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 stim test, you would get their morning cortisol, uh, you would or a baseline cortisol. They haven't taken any hydrocortisone that day. You would stim them and then check and see exactly. if you know. And you would do this once a month right. to see if their adrenals right. are coming. And they out. can always take you know their hydrocortisone or if they're taking prednisone after the stim test is done. But you would mm -hmm. withhold that day's dose for the testing until the testing is complete. Okay. And you told us earlier it was something like at least twelve to sixteen hours since they taken any hydrocortisone before you right. you do the stim and test. And for prednisone, it's twenty four hours because okay. prednisone prednisone is longer acting. Yeah. Okay, got it. So yeah, so if you were going to check a morning cortisol, of someone on prednisone, you would have to just tell them 24 hours, you know, stop it 24 hours before we're going to check. And then, right. Okay. All right. This is much, and much more along clear those now, lines Paul. of teal. So when I'm writing the referral to endocrinology, I always show, do I capitalize the E in endocrinology or is it okay to leave it lowercase? It's something that I always worry about. <laughs> I don't think we even notice. Okay, fair. <laughs> Um, I, I did want to ask, um, in seriousness, I, I feel like we are hopefully savvy enough to recognize for the patient who's like on, you know, these recurrent prednisone courses for, say, bad COPD or who's chronically uh, immunosuppressed for rheumatologic issues. I, I think we think about adrenal insufficiency for, for patients who undergo changes there. What about inhaled medications? Are there any instances where we should be concerned about adrenal insufficiency for someone who's on, say, an in chronic inhaled uh, corticosteroids for, um, say, COPD, for instance? That's right. Yeah. So in general, you know, the systemic effect from inhaled glucocorticoids is not enough to cause adrenal insufficiency, except for two situations. One could be a person who's just overdosing on them, like taking them every two hours rather than twice a day or something. So that could be possible. But the one that we've seen more often and that's been reported in the literature is an interaction action with certain drugs that um, that inhibit the metabolization of steroids. So, you know, the, I think the one that's most commonly recognized is protease inhibitors in the, you know, the, um, the antiretroviral regimens uh, for the treatment of HIV. So we've all seen this, and it's not just with inhalers, but also, you know, a lot of patients get intraarticular injections of steroids. But what'll happen with those cases, just so you, you know, you, we understand what to look for is they'll actually first develop iatrogenic Cushing syndrome. I mean, that's how they'll present because 
where they're taking their beclomethazone inhaler and their you know protease inhibitors inter- is interfering with its clearance from the liver so it just accumulates like they get tons and tons of their that steroid accumulating in their blood and people have actually done studies where they measured the levels of triamcinolone or beclomethazone in these people and they're very high for months um, so they get the big red stretch marks and the big round red moon face if you measure their cortisol it's very low you know obviously the the pituitary and adrenals shut off when they see there's so much steroid in the system. So, you, you know, they're not having symptomatic adrenal sufficiency. They're actually going the other way. The problem is if they abruptly stop their beclomethazone or their protease inhibitor, now they're in tough in a tough situation because it'll take months and months for their adrenal, you know, to, to regrow back from that atrophy for their HPA axis to wake back up and for them to make cortisol again. Um, so, you know, in some of these cases where I've seen them, if we were able to stop the offending steroid that was causing, or, you know, the problem, then I put them on hydrocortisone and measured their cortisol every few months and, you know, everything we talked about earlier. Um, and then once their cortisol came to normal, you know, um, got them off of it. But if they have to be on lifelong beclomethazone and protease inhibitor, something has to be done about that because the iatrogenic Cushing syndrome is bad. Yeah. I, I had one patient that told me about that. He, he was on hydrocortisone and I, and he initially had had this orthostatic hypotension and then all, but then eventually he was getting hypertensive. He said that they started the, the hydrocortisone when he was having orthostatic hypotension. And I said, but why did they think you had adrenal insufficiency? He said, they said it was because of my asthma medicines, but he, he had HIV. So he was, I think he was on a protease inhibitor and the inhaled steroid. And then when they stopped that, he had adrenal insufficiency. So he was on hydrocortisone, but no one was following to see if his adrenals were waking up. No one was tapering the dose. And I pick up his case years later and he's still on it. And now he's becoming hypertensive. Right. So my, my question, I guess, is, uh, I mean, in his case, it was a matter of tapering it and then you know, the hypertension got a bit better. But if someone is has primary adrenal insufficiency and they're starting to get hypertensive, how do we handle that? Do do we drop the fludrocortisone? Do we taper back the hydrocortisone? Is that is that common or do we have to think something else is happening? Yeah. This is a high level question that, you know, I, and I know you guys like to have questions that experts don't agree upon, but you know, to answer the question, the, the, the first part of the question that, you, you know, your case is first, I guess in that sort of a case, you could check their cortisol level, you know, because what you're insinuating is that maybe their adrenals recovered after they stopped those, you know, mm-hmm. in, uh, offending medicines. And now we're giving additional glucocorticoids and hydrocortisone that's making them hypertensive. So, you know, you could check the cortisol and if you show that, yeah, their HPA axis has recovered and they're making adequate cortisol, tell them to stop taking hydrocortisone. And, you know, maybe that was causing their high blood pressure. That's, that's a little different than, you know, than the, the, what, what the question you led into there. So if you have someone who, who you know has Addison's, you know, primary adrenal sufficiency, and they also developed hypertension, what do you do? This is actually a very challenging um, scenario. So, you know, when I was training, um, I remember some of my mentors, you know, and still some people would argue that, you know, you could cut back on their fludrocortisone, that not everyone needs fludrocortisone. So if they're able to maintain their potassium and they don't notice any symptoms um, and they're getting hypertensive on, you know, when you give fludrocortisone, which obviously could could increase blood pressure, um, that you could stop it in some people. The Endocrine Society guideline on this topic came out firmly and said no. They said that if you know, they have primary adrenal insufficiency that you should give them some fludrocortisone. And if they just happen to develop hypertension, you should treat them with an ACE inhibitor or an ARB was the preferred agent that they, you know, they recommended. But this is a very challenging scenario and hypertension could occur due to um, over replacement with either hydrocortisone or fludrocortisone. Mm-hmm. So, you know, again, I think someone, uh, you know, an endocrinologist with experience in this might want to look at that case to see if there's room to back off on those. Yeah. But it might not be related to that. Remember, just let's all remember just for a minute that all of us, you know, quote unquote, people with normal adrenals um, have normal amounts of cortisol and, and aldosterone, but many of us have essential hypertension. So, you know, we shouldn't make our patients with adrenal sufficiency suffer from inadequate cortisol and aldosterone replacement because, you know, to treat their hypertension, you know, so if they have hypertension, it happens. They may need to also be treated separately for hypertension. Yeah. I've also seen a patient with, I guess it would be secondary. They had uh, their pituitary, they had a pituitary adenoma removed and they were on all these hormone replacement after a pituitary surgery and they became hypertensive and like, I guess, like you're saying, you know, it doesn't necessarily mean it's, 
it's the hydrocortisone. You can just have essential hypertension with normal hormones that lots of people have hypertension. Absolutely. Hadn't thought of it that way. Okay. Probably I'll still run the case by an endocrinologist. Yeah, <laughs> just, no, but you know, absolutely, it's still important. <laughs> I think, you know, you know, it, it's is it just a coincidence that after a pituitary surgery, the person had got hypertension that they never had before? So you know, until proven otherwise, one really does have to look carefully at those hormone replacements because over replacing any of those, you know, including testosterone and thyroid and hydrocortisone, mm -hmm. could exacerbate hypertension. Um, so maybe there is something that needs to be <laughs> looked at there. But yeah, but it's not always the hormone replacement. Sometimes people just get other problems. Well, Paul, I think we're we're getting out of our depth with the question, so I think that's probably yeah. a good point that we're we've we've sort of we're ready for take home points. I think I I the capital E personally, like I just feel like it seems more respectful. So that's just, I mean, that's just a me well, thing. Do you do you not like to have any fun when you're uh, in clinic? Like, don't you, you don't like to challenge your horizons at all? You Absolutely just kinda... not. No, I hate challenges in clinic. I like smooth sailing and referrals. <laughs> It's all like flu shots, uh, you know, 100%. It's, it's all just a hundred. Okay. All right, Paul. Uh, all right. So I guess, Atil, uh, can we, can we get a couple take home points? We've talked about so much today, but a couple things you really want people to remember about this topic. Yeah, I think the first one that I got, I just after talking to all of you, is don't be afraid to check cortisol. Um, you know, it's you don't want to miss adrenal insufficiency. It's uh, it's it could be life threatening due to adrenal crisis. And you know, we get eight a.m. labs all the time anyway, and people for checking their fasting labs and lipids and different things. And you know, don't check cortisol routinely, please. That's terrible because you might not know what to do with the results. But in people where you have a high clinical suspicion of adrenal insufficiency, you could help them a lot by. Um, identifying low cortisol levels. That, that would be the, um, the first point to make. Another um, take-home point, which actually we didn't talk about, but I can plug it right now, is there's no such thing as adrenal fatigue. And I'm glad you guys didn't ask me about that. But <laughs> there's, there's some patients who will come to you and say, you know, I have adrenal fatigue. So our, you know, our um, standpoint on this as the uh, academic endocrinologist is that that's not a real diagnosis based in fact. Yeah, we... we um... Oh, I think it was, I can't remember the name, but he, he writes Endocrine Secrets. Uh, okay. And we, at, at the ACE meeting, actually, you know, you're, you're with us because ACE, ACE hooked us up with you right. as a guest. And uh, we, we interviewed the writer of Endocrine Secrets or one of the editors. And he, he did a whole talk about these adrenal disorders that patients read about on the internet and then come to the clinic. And it was, right. it was a very well attended <laughs> talk at the conference, reverse T3 and all these kind of things, uh, talking about all these. Yes, we call things. that endocriminology. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. All right. Well, Atil, I mean, this is fantastic. We'll think of a reason to have you back on the show in the okay, future. Sure. Uh, I'd love I, to. I think, yeah. yeah, I think, I think you have a future in podcasting. This was great. <laughs> hey, so thank, thank you. you. Yeah, thanks All right. so much. Thanks again. My pleasure. Have a great evening. This has been another episode of the Curbsiders, bringing you a little knowledge food for your brain hole. Yummy. <laughs> it's actually a little more enthusiasm than I'm used to from you, Helena. Uh, still hungry for more? Join our Patreon and get all of our episodes ad-free, plus twice monthly bonus episodes at patreon.com slash curbsiders. You can find our show notes at thecurbsiders.com and sign up for our mailing list to get our weekly show notes in your inbox, including our Curbsiders Digest, which recaps the latest practice-changing articles, guidelines, and news in internal medicine. And we're committed to high-value, practice-changing knowledge, and we want your feedback, so you can email us at askcurbsiders at gmail.com. We'd also love it if you subscribe, rate, and review the show on YouTube, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, really anywhere you can get podcasts. A reminder that this and most episodes are available for CME through VCU Health at curbsiders.vcuhealth.org. Wanted to give a special thanks to our writer and producer for this episode, Dr. Elena Gibson, and to our whole Curbsiders team. The show is produced and edited by the team at Podpaste. Elizabeth Proto runs our social media. Chris the Chew Man Chew moderates the Discord. Stuart Brigham composed our theme music. And with all that, until next time, I've been Dr. Matthew Frank Wadden. Elena Gibson here. <laughs> and as always, I remain Dr. Paul Nelson Williams. Thank you and goodbye.